in that training is because after years, after probably two decades, I didn't do no education after leaving the school young. Yeah. Um, I've done probably two decades of taking drugs, ra raving, um, raving and taking drugs and anything associated around yeah. that, you know what I mean, for, um, for two decades, you know what I mean. And then it, uh, it got so bad that I smashed myself up, you know what I mean? I, I ended up with um, kidney stones and uh, there was a point where I was in hospital, you know what I mean? I, got, I was in hospital and I had to sign the thing to say that I'll have an operation because my kidneys were failing. Yeah. And they was like, look, if you don't have this operation, you're, you're basically dying if you don't have this operation. Yeah. Like, so um, I had that and that was like a life changing experience because I was laying there half dead. I was laying there half dead in the, um, in the hospital, and um, I was thinking to myself, I was laying there and I was saying, pray. I was saying, God, if you spare me, if you let me get better, um, I will, I will change my life around. I'll get back in the boxing gym, and I'll do, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to repent and be better. You know. Yeah. And. Um, and that's what happened. That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, I had that conversation with God, and I made a um, made a change in my life. The past was dark. Lost friends to the cage and the grave. Police attacks, brutality, racism, a struggle with the system. The future's a lot brighter. Getting the youths off the road into the ring. Gloves on toe to toe for a better future. The ring and the boxing changed his life. It can do the same for you. Man like Coach Kitson. We need them to understand how dedicated you are because obviously everyone needs to eat. We all need to eat. But the youth you got here today, you're not charging them nothing. This is for the community and for the youth to go and get some guidance show and listen, train hard and make something so. That's right, I mean, um, I've never been into charging the kids that I train. You know, the kids that I train from the community, I do that for love. I do try to do a bit of personal training here and there to support what I'm doing with, with them, but there's, you know, the ones that are young, that serious, that want to do the sport, I, I've never charged them, you know, I, 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 do, it, I do it for the love. The Artist TV in association with Block 5 Entertainment and you know what it is, untold stories, footstep free, man like Coach Kitson. What's going on over there brother, you good? Yeah my brother, I'm good. Ah, well we're down here in Summer Layton, you know what it is, we've done the Angel Town, we've done the Baghdad, now we're in Summer Layton. So here what I'm saying, let's start this big man with chicks and man like Julian, Red Dragons have both done interviews on the footsteps. Talk to us, what did you think of their interviews and what's your connection with them? Yeah man, they're top guys from the community. Um, I come across them at Flatsman, um, teaching martial arts, I'm into martial arts, boxing is my thing, Muay Thai, kickboxing is their thing. But um, yeah, they're good, good positive role models in the community, They've always had um, good positive words formed for myself. Um, one thing I like about those guys is that I've, you know, there's, in the sports world, in the coaching world, there's a lot of poachers, um, a lot of snatchers, and uh, I've had fighters that have trained with me, come across them, train with them, and come back to me with positive feedback where they've said that, yeah, that guy's a good trainer, he's a good person, and they've spoke good, highly of me, which means a lot, especially in this world that we're in um, of sports and uh, uh, martial arts where there's a lot of cultures and you know they're kind of people, like sneezy people so to have good people honorable people like them is like I appreciate it I respect it. Uh, well I'm gonna start by telling them that I do my research and if I didn't know you've been through it you wouldn't be here now because the only people that are doing these untold stories are real people that's lived through it and seen it better so I'm going to start it like this, big man. Give us the insight to your childhood. Where was you growing and what was you seeing? Yeah, so I started off in Stockwell, um, opposite Stockwell Tube Station, a state called Stockwell Gardens. That was uh, in the hotspot area, the area what the kids, the youth call the hotspot. 
Um, I lived there for up until about six, went to Alan Edwards School down in the um, uh, Binford Road in that little Langsdown Way, that kind of area there, went to school there. Don't remember too much about that because I was young, but we left from over there when I was around six, seven, ended up over Lando Road, um, a place that I love, you know what I mean? Uh, Lando Road, if you don't know, is in between Stockholm Park Estate and Fenwick Estate. You know, one end you've got Stockholm Park Estate, the other end you've got like Red Brick and Clapham, Clapton. Um, so yeah, nice place to grow up. You had the ZQT's um, Arcade and Kenwick's Arcade. So you've got a lot of who's who and everybody hanging out there. So, you know, I got to know all the faces, see all the faces. I went to um, St. Lee, primary school, got uh, chucked out of there, well I never got chucked out of there, my mum took me out of there because I was getting into trouble and weren't getting on with the teachers there, Got went to Hazelrig, ended up getting expelled from there because um, you know I was kind of getting into fights from young, my mum didn't like, um, did, she, she, didn't, she wanted me to tough and she didn't want me to get bullied so although she didn't encourage me to fight and stuff, I can see like she had like a spark in her eye of happiness when I when I stood up for myself and defended myself and you know that that put something in me that made me want to be a stand up self righteous stand up type of guy you know. Right now you're training the young lad. What does yeah. that mean to you? What's it like when you see him coming in, putting in the work? It means the world to me. Um, it means the world to me. These these young lads. I mean this particular one. He's got a. Um, Good family, beautiful family, you know, supportive family. So he's not like he, he's coming from the ends, but don't get it twisted, but he's coming from a good family, a good supportive family. But he's, his dad is a childhood friend of mine. So a lot of the fighters that I train, I select them that way. They're childhood friends, sons. So they're friends of the family. So I'm not, they mean, I'm not gonna ever abuse them. But remember, this boxing world can be, can be a horrible world. Yeah. A very seedy world, but these these kids to me they're fam they family. You know what I mean? They mean they mean the world to me. And um, I ain't got no boys neither. I've got one little girl. So although they got good parents and most of the fighters I've got, they've got good supportive parents and that. I'm not trying to be their father figures, but to me they 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 let their mind. You know what I'm saying? To the lovers. You know what I mean? To the max. Come on, come on, go. Three, that's it. What do for you? Well, boxing keeps me fit, keeps me out of trouble, and I just love it, and the training of it, and everything. Who are you looking out to? What boxes are you feeding? I'm Dylan White, Tyson Fury, and Mayo. Uh, and Canelo. Say no more. So as you're talking about mum, let us know what was family life like for you growing up? How was family? Um, family life, I'm glad you touched on that, you know, because family life it was good up until a point. Family life, you know, childhood, childhood was very, very good. I was fortunate enough to have mum at home, have dad at home, and, and granddad at home as well, living with us. But um, there was a time when Unfortunately, when I was about 13, where my dad passed away and my granddad passed away within about six months of each other. So you can, if you can imagine, we had two kind of incomes in the house, things was all right, then all of a sudden we were poor, we were dirt poor, and, and um, grieving for granddad and grieving for dad and stuff like that. And you know, that's, that's when time, time got a bit hard and, um, I, as the older sibling in the house, even though I'd hold a half brothers and sisters, but the older sibling from my immediate family, I felt the responsibility to try and be that, that role model, that dad model. Unfortunately, um, I chose the roads as a way of supporting my family and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, and you know, thieving, stealing, and stuff like that. And you know, uh, got into smoking cannabis and you know, stuff like that. Yeah, so okay, you've shown us big man that life got tough, so you hit them roads. Now we're gonna show them some of the madnesses that will happen when you hit them roads. Obviously you was out there, you had friends that were out there with you. Right now, some of your best friends 
uh, in jail doing life sentences. What did that do to you when you found out that's the way their world went? Yeah, you know, um, it was like seeing the big sentences was a good thing. I mean, not, not trying to glamorize that lifestyle, but when I, I was one that got into it from young, and um, you know, I did build up quite a record, and my record is probably, you know, there's numbers, it's got, it's, it's got a lot of numbers on there, and I'm not glamorizing it at all, but luckily for myself, I was doing this, I done this dirt really, really young, so by the time I was reaching like a certain age, I see the older guys that I was knocking about with getting some dirty, some real big sentences. And um, luckily for me, I was able to see what happened to them and kind of slow down what I was doing a little bit so that um, I didn't, you know, I didn't really want to see, I didn't see myself doing them kind of big sentences. Yeah. You know? Okay, so with regards to the fact that we're touching on sentences, obviously if you hit road, there's a chance you're going to go to jail. And you did go to jail, big man. You've had to sit in those cages. Let the youths know, what did you learn in them cages that made you know, you know what, this ain't for me? Well, you know, prison, I went to Felton um, in 1994. Um, around the time, if anybody's ever watched any documentaries or know anything about Felton, that was around the time when they were doing the gladiator fighting. And I was a victim of the gladiator fighting. And um, you know, it, it's not pretty, man. It's, um, it's not pretty at all. One thing you're gonna find in Felton is you're gonna find who's real and who's not. You know, you might, you might be out here on the streets and you might have a little reputation. You, you might have big brothers, uncles, people flying the flag for you. But in there, you got no one. You got to stand up on yourself, and you're gonna be kept. That's where you'll be counted. If you're not real, and you ain't the realest, inside there, you're gonna get found out for sure. Um, so, not it's not a nice place for no one. And you know, if you can avoid it, please do. You know what I mean? Please do your best to avoid it. I'm a boxer. As an amateur, I've three amateur fights now. I'm transitioning to be a professional boxer. Also, I do a lot of community work here. Like I help train the youth from ages five upwards. And I do a bit of personal training here as well. Okay, so with regards to your personal training, what have you seen from the people you're training, the youth that are coming up? Me personally, I think personal training is a very, it's a very insightful job. Because when you come here, you're essentially seeing someone when they're vulnerable. Because in the sense of their training, they exhaust, um, exhausting themselves and they come almost in a state of weakness. So they are trusting you with the ability to be able to guide them and put them in the right direction to work towards the fitness goal. It's like similar things at Life Soul. It's a similar thing with the youth. When the youth come in, they're looking for guidance themselves and they look at someone they can relate to. So when they see people like me and Kitson, um, they feel much more comfortable. Um, maybe they need someone to talk to, say, you know what, this and that. Maybe sometimes they just want someone to have a laugh with, you know, someone to talk about with. But it's all about meeting them on the same playful that they understand. So you don't want to be talk, you don't want to talk at them. Okay, you talk at someone. They're always going to get defensive. They're going to respond in a negative way. Yeah. You always want to talk to them. It's not glamorous. It's not a nice. I tell you one thing. Is is that's funny? Is things come and go in your memory. But their memories, and I'm, I'm 43 yet now, that's years ago. But it is fresh in the back of my, everything that happened in there is fresh in the back of my mind like yesterday. And the reason it's fresh in the back of your mind is because you, you might forget good times, but I'm telling you, you ain't going to forget bad times. <laughs> so to help these youths really understand, you tell us, what was the worst thing you went through in them jail cells? Um, I had. I had tea thrown in my face. I thought um, I thought it was gonna. I thought I was gonna bubble up and burn up. But luckily, there weren't no sugar in there. It was just it was just the hot water. You know what I mean? Um, and I got. And when I say I went through the gladiator fighting, I, I had about six or seven serious fights in there. Some of them what we call cell fights, where you're banged up with just another guy in a cell. And uh, it's funny because I didn't realise what was going on at the time. But afterwards, years down the line, I bumped into one or two people that I was in there with and they explained to me like, 
why me and them had a fight and how it was set up by the screws and stuff like that. So, you know, um, yeah, this, you know what I mean? It was just tough time, man. Yeah. Okay, so you was back on road after your spells. We want to know, what's the worst thing you've seen on road? I've seen it, I've seen it all, man. I've seen violence, um, I've seen, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've took L's, I've took W's, I've been, um, I've been injured, I've seen people injured, seen deaths, lots, I, I'm not the only one, you grew up in Brixton, we all know, if you've grown up in Brixton, you know somebody that's been murdered or somebody that's been yeah. taken out, but myself, I mean, my two, two that really affected, few of them affected me, but two that affected me was two kids that, that got murdered on the same street that I grew up with, one got murdered at 19, one got, one was about 21. They was actually best friends, and they 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 both got taken out of the game in, in uh, the worstest worstest of ways. Yeah. Um, another one of my friends, not so long ago, got murdered um, outside a boxing event. Uh, that one really affected me. And it's funny, you know, because you know so many, and you know we can read out names and name after name after name. But it's weird because some of them, like, they all affect you in some kind of way, but some of them affect you more than others, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we don't want to see it, really. we don't, like, you know, it's not nice. And to know that these kids are this, this so every day now, you know what I mean? It's like, you know what I mean? Like, that's why I'm doing this boxing work and why I'm doing this community work, because I want to see it an end to it or try and be a help. And as I said, I've done my bad stuff, which is, which is why I do work so tire tirelessly with the kids in the community trying to repent. And there's a lot of people like myself that never, that had a colorful background, had uh, never had it easy or got involved in crime, got involved in drugs. But like some of these people are the best people to talk to these kids because they've been there, they've seen it, they've done it. And because they've matured now and they see the error of their ways, they're able to speak a language that these kids understand and um, able to try and push them in the right direction and help guide them so that they don't make the same mistakes that we made growing up. What are you saying to me, big man? Obviously, the roads are dirty out here. You're down here doing the training with kids. And what's it do for you, for your mind and your body? The mental health, man, just keeps me in the right state of mind. As long as I know that I'm here, I'm focused. What's your changes in yourself since you've been doing this? It's better confidence. It's not very safe away, man. So now that I've got to do the same focus, keeping myself to myself, and just trying to be as close as I can. Let's get on to that now. Like you say, you've done with all of that. You've woke up and you said to yourself, you know what? I want to help the youths. So when was the first time you started wanting to put your boxing and what you've built up in the game into the youths? Well, I was training down at, um, I started training, I started getting back into, I started, I boxed as a kid, and then I got back into boxing pretty late after um, years, decades of raving and abusing my body. And I got back into, bo I got sick and I decided, right, I'm gonna get back into boxing. Um, at the time, um, when I started visiting boxing gyms again, I started at Fitzroy Lodge in Lambeth. So if you're in the Kennington area, you're in the Lambeth area and you want to get involved in martial arts or something and you can't come to Brixton or for any kind of gang or anything like that, check out the Fitzroy Lodge. Um, after Fitzroy Lodge, I, I, I stopped going to Fitzroy Lodge um, because I realised that there was a gym local to me and I never had, I, 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 I never had the money to be travelling up and down and this and yeah. that. And it was easier for me to use the gym lo local to me. Because um, and what happened was, I was already training fighters, but I noticed that a lot of these fighters wasn't giving me the love that I felt like I deserved because I never had a good, a big record. So I, for me, I wanted to um, have some fights and get something on camera so that these people can see that I can, I can do this thing. You know? Yeah. You know what I mean? And have some visuals out there 
for them to see that I can do this sort of thing and that's what I did. Okay, so you showing us there that you were to get some visuals out there and let them know what you can do. We'll ask you now, let them all know what is the biggest thing you've achieved in boxing yourself before you even started training others. Okay, so my biggest thing that I achieved was not really that big to others, but big to myself. Um, I started boxing as a youth, as a nine-year-old kid. I had one boxing season at 11, and I didn't do too well. And it kind of it kind of it put me into a depression at such a young age, to be quite honest, because I thought I was going to be the next best thing, and I, I got off to a bad start. So basically, I had six fights, went the distance in all, um, put a good performance in all, but this was the 80s and um, there was a few decisions that didn't go my way that I thought should have went my way and, uh, and I got disheartened with it. I actually, my boxing record was actually six fights, five losses and one win. Although I believed I won four and lost two. Um, I think that I was on the, it was the 80s and I felt like I was on the wrong end of some racial decisions. But um, it is what it was, my record was that um, I was actually embarrassed about it. I used to go around and lie. I used to tell everybody I was a boxer and I boxed, but I used to tell them that I had six fights and one fight and lost one. But it's so ironic, yeah, was that when I got back into the boxing, I had um, six fights, one fight, and lost one. So I, I, I was able to turn that record around, which was which um, might not be big to everybody else, but to me that was like amazing. You know what I mean? To me that was like winning a world title, you know what I mean? I, I was able to turn around this childhood nightmare that should have been a blessing, but turned out to be a nightmare, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Okay then, well let's get into the fact that you've done the unlicensed boxing. You came up in that, that's where you had your fights. Let's go into Caesar Stratton. Obviously you had the chance to win something there. Yeah, so Caesar Stratton was, I did the unlicensed on the governor, what they call the, the um, governor title, a box for the governor title and I worked on that unlicensed network. Now for me, I mean it's some, a lot of people frown upon it, a lot of, like the mainstream boxing they frown upon it, I always on the unlicensed boxing, this and that. But for me it was brilliant, you know, it was a total different sport. The rules was a bit different, you know, you, people's head butting, kicking, all kinds of nuts, madness, you know, you fight the weight categories was you know, you could fight someone, a giant, and you know what I mean? You might fight someone with no experience, you might fight someone with loads of experience, little gloves, this and that. So for me, it was a total, I respected it, I liked it, and it was a total different um, sport, if you like, you know what I mean? It was, it was yeah. a lot more gruesome. Um, so yeah, I, I boxed there, I enjoyed it, I had an amazing time. Luckily for me, I mean, I boxed some bodybuilding looking type guys, Every time, most of the time I was turning up to fight there, my mates were seeing the guys I was fighting and thinking you're gonna get done, you know what I mean? But um, the truth of the matter is most of these guys were more bodybuilder type guys and not real, real boxers. And obviously I, I boxed from a kid, so I had that experience, you know? Yeah. You know I mean? So let's get into that main fight. Yeah. Caesar Stretton. Yeah. So it was a madness, big man. Yeah, so Clubs I, I, were coming off a couple times. You didn't last the distance yet. From them that was watching, you had the man on the ropes a couple of times. So yeah. why is it you didn't roll all the way through? Well, so what happened, I, I had a few fights on there. Um, won, a, won a few fights. I won a few fights on there. I never lost up until this time. So I got opportunity to fight for the governor title. And, uh, which, you know, for me, that, like, for, for me, that was like my world title, you know what I mean? That, was, that meant a lot to me. It might not have meant a lot to everybody else, but it meant a lot to me. So I was going to go and give it my all. So um, what happened is I boxed and it was funny, man, because like uh, I had a game plan. I seen, I seen this guy box and he was aggressive in that. And my game plan was like the first time he tries any of that thing with me, I'm going to let him have it. So, so that's what I did. And it's unlicensed boxing. And previous to me, the Brixton boy being on there, everybody was stamping and head button and blah 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 and getting load away with God knows what. But unknown to me, like the first time when it's me now, I let him have it, and the first thing they're doing is taking points. You know what I mean? So what happened is uh, there's a big kickoff and all that, and then um, 
they took points again, they took points again. So eventually I'm sitting in my corner thinking to myself, hang on here, like these people are trying to mug me off, they're robbing me and how they dealing with me, like, I kind of knew what was going on, or I felt I knew what was going on. And I was like, why, well, you know what, it's because I'm from Brixton and I ain't, I ain't that usual kind of East End, you know what I mean, like Cockney kind of, you know what I mean, and they don't like our shine, we're coming in the place kind of doing what we want to do and they don't like it, you know what I mean? So that, that's how I felt anyway. And all this was going through my mind during the fight when they was taking the points and that. So I got upset with myself and um, I said to myself, you know what, stuff your, um, your title. You get me, you're not gonna rob me and uh, I ain't having it. So I lost my nut in there and I ended up getting disqualified and I didn't get to win the title, which hurt because I wanted that title. As I said, it was like the, like, like the um, world title for me. But at the same time, it's my favourite fight, you know what I mean? Looking back at it, it's, a sight, it's exciting, people love it. If you go on YouTube, you see it, it's got the most, it's got the most views. Um, it's got the most views on the YouTube uh, out of all the fights that I had in that, you know what I mean? It's got like, a, quite a lot of views, so people like it. You get a lot of madness in the comments and that, you know what I mean? But yeah. for me, it was, um, it was, it was my favourite fight out of all the fights I had, even, yeah. though I, even though I lost and I didn't win the title, you know what I mean? So, Okay, well let's finish that fight off with them at the end. Like obviously it's all gone a bit peak, people are jumping in the ring. Then out of nowhere, man seeing Peter Bailey. <laughs> like what's going on there? What was the connection with Peter Bailey? I see he's trying to stop the fight as well. Yeah, so Peter now, Peter was working with, uh, with the, the promotion team. He was a uh, security and like, you know, this governor thing, the way it was, it was played out at the time or the way they were selling it to us at the time it was like put down the knives and the guns and come and rep your community and rep your ends you know what I mean with your, with your gloves on you yeah. know what I mean so it's that kind of thing so I think Peter they, they Peter had a big name on the, on the roads in it so especially in our community of Brixton so I feel like he was just there to kind of control the Brixton the Brixton mob and, and obviously he had that respect so and we gave him that respect so he, he was there doing that, playing that, playing that role, that, yeah. secu that security role there. You know what I mean? But um, that's where that's where I first got to to meet him and know him. I, obviously, I've heard loads about him, but that's where I got to know him and got to meet him. And you know, we, I can't say we, we're best of friends, but we we always got a, we we got along well. You, know uh, I mean? you get me? Okay, so give us an insight to the people that are here watching and they want to know who have you been around. Who have you sparred with? Who have you talked to in the boxing game that people would know of? So at Fitzroy Lodge, um, at Fitzroy Lodge, there was like, I've had a few good I've had a few good people in my life. You know what I mean? Um, that have helped me out. You know, at Fitzroy Lodge, there was the the old man, the trainer. He's no longer with us. There was Mickey Carney. He's responsible for training uh, the likes of David Hay. Anthony Smalls, Ted Bami, Mark Rygate, um, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And uh, if you was blessed to have met this guy, proper character, old white fella, um, smart, trim, anybody that, that's had a blessing to be around him, got nothing but love and good things to say, say about him. He was just, a, for me, I believe, it, I'm very spiritual and I believe that there's angels walking this earth and he was one of them, but he was one of them. But yeah, the, I mean, whilst I was there, you had Leon Williams, uh, he was a good boxer, Anthony Smalls was a good boxer. I wasn't there at the time when David Hay was there, you know, but I was, the, the best person I trained with myself there was uh, Anthony Smalls. And Anthony Smalls at the time was, when I was training there, was the current British, European and Commonwealth champion. And um, oh yeah, Ted Bamley was there. And little, a little Isaac Dogbo was there, who, yeah. who went on to become be a world champion. Um, little Isaac Dogbo was there. So yeah, I, I had the privilege of training with and alongside some pretty good boxers and trainers. Okay. Uh, after sorry, after that, can I go? Yeah. After yeah. that, I went over to McGill's, and at McGill's, I trained with Richard Williams, who was a Commonwealth and IBO champion from Stockwell, from the local community. Um, and then we had Isaac Chamberlain, who went on to sell out the O2 Arena, and he's still boxing now, doing very well. 
um, and then there was trainers such as um, John Sims, Richard, uh, John Sims, Don Davis, um, like legendary trainers that have done big things in the community for years and years. I was able to be around them, learn from them, and train alongside some good fighters. Um, and quietly, quietly, I was always slightly confident that I was as good as, um, as good as the best of them. Because um, obviously, I had my lot of experience. I've been around it from young, underachieved, so to speak. But you know, um, I put in my hours, and uh, I always believed that I was um, just as good as as the best of them. Okay. Well, you just mentioned Miguel's there. Anyone who comes from the South London, mainly Brixton area, knows that that gym's legendary. So you tell us, what has Miguel's done to help you? What can you give Miguel's to show, listen, so, support them? So this, so I talk about uh, being spiritual and having angels in, um, in my life. Two of them angels came from, um, came from the, boom, 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 from Miguel's boxing gym. One was Steve and Miguel the owner of um, the boxing gym. He he just helped me and supported me, took a liking to me, helped me and supported me and let me do anything, um, anything, any support I asked him for, he gave me. Um, and so him, another angel that came into my life um, and allowed me to be the person I am today. Also, there was a guy there, when I first, a little story, when I first started um, at Miguel's, there was a guy there called Rufus. Rufus was a bit of a mixed martial artist. He'd done boxing, he'd done kickboxing, he'd done quite a lot. And um, at that time, he was he, he was the best fighter in the gym. And Ru but he weren't a bully. He was a nice geezer, you know what I mean? He was a good geezer. So what happened was when I first started getting, really getting back into the boxing, I was training with him and his team, uh, Mark Ninja as well. He was, Ninja was coaching him. And I was training with that team, and what happened was I used to spar with the, with Rufus, and uh, he would spend me out round or two, and I'd be I'd be finished, I'd be slaughtered, you know what I mean? But weak, but but in my mind I was like, you know what? Because I knew I boxed from a kid, and that in my mind I was like, you know what? You're better than this man. You're just unfit. You just got to keep pushing. So day by day, week by week, I got better and better, and then eventually, after about possibly a year, maybe a bit more. Eventually, one day I went in there and we done ten rounds, and he was spent after the ten rounds, and um, and and it's mad because he's an angel, and this is how spiritual it is. From that day till now, I've never seen him, never heard of him. It was like he just come into my life to give me this belief that I have now of that. Because basically, he was the best guy at the gym, as far as I'm concerned. From what I could see, he was the best guy at the gym at the time, and when. I got the better of him that one time. Only that one time, I never see him again. So it left me feeling like I'm the best fighter in the gym. You yeah. get me? You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I got I had this confidence. I started walking around saying that uh, I, just, I used to call myself TBA S two N, the best around, second to none. And I was to believe it. You know what I mean? So I feel like he was like another angel. He came into my life to give me this belief, give me this confidence. You know what I mean? And it's disappeared like that, you know what I'm saying to yeah. you? So it's, it's spiritual. Up to now, I don't know what he's doing with his career, where he went. Some, I'm sure uh, Julian and Chiggs and these guys will know this guy because he used to do the kicking and yeah. stuff as well, you know what I'm saying? And if anybody knows where he is, yeah, please um, get in touch. <laughs> uh, well, let's get it straight. Like you say, you're Brixton based. There's blocks, there's estates all over Brixton. Young youths are dying in them. Knives, guns, it's happening. So you are training the youths. You tell us, what can a youth learn from coming to train with you? Four from Angel Town, the other gentleman training is from Tal Sil. And the fight's nice in it. Yeah. That's what the youths need to see. 100%. Ah, two areas coming together and feeling good with the training they're doing. 100%. All about positivity, positive energy, two people coming together, different walks of life. <laughs>
When you come down to these sessions, yeah. like you told us earlier, you feel a differentness in you. 100%. But when it's all finished and you're going on sweating, what sort of feeling does that give you now you've done a good workout? You know, it is all those positive endorphins being released. You feel good. It's like there's never a workout that you're going to regret when you're training with kids. You know what I'm saying? It hurts. You've got to go through it. You know what I'm saying? Pain is temporary. It's just a little last time. Whole seal. The other man is Angel Town. You two's got a nice feeling together. You're training hard. You both crack the joke. Let the youths know what's it like knowing another area together are doing right. It's good, like, like before back in the days, the argument now, like, we're bringing it up so the whole community is getting together and we're stopping the knife crime and all of that. Oh. We're working hard. And what's your personal opinion on the fact that out here there is young brothers killing each other? Um, it's bad. You see Black Lives Matter and then they go and kill each other. So yeah, it's bad. We shouldn't be doing that. We work hard and get to where we need to go. Yeah, yeah. With your way of thinking and your training, yeah. what do you say to anyone who is going down the wrong road? Literally, don't go down that road because you're going to let them all end up in jail or die, literally. Literally, yeah. Man. <laughs> the day's done. The two youths have had a good train. What's it doing for you now? What's the next step with our team to then? Yeah, hopefully they go home, chill out, relax, and don't get into no trouble. Um, I'll always be telling them to like go straight on, don't exert yourself outside in the gym. So. It's about relaxing, relaxing now, so hopefully they relax and stay out of trouble. You know, the first things I'm going to be telling these kids is like, you know, you've got to believe in yourself, you've got to treat yourself like a million dollars, you know, the only type place, um, this is, you're going to get these from this type of talk from sports coaches, yeah, you, you don't, the only place you're going to be, we want you to exert yourself is inside the gym, we don't want you to leave the gym and run across the road carelessly, be jumping over walls carelessly, doing anything where you can injure, hurt or harm yourself and, and possibly ruin your career. We definitely don't want you getting into gangs and getting into street violence and having being stabbed or stabbing someone, getting locked up, getting killed, because that's going to ruin your dreams, ruin your career. So these are the type of advice you're going to be getting, getting from boxing coaches and them kind of mentors in the community, um, you know, so that's the type of thing. And then the other thing is build, building confidence and belief and understanding that your with, with great power becomes great responsibility. So i.e. if you can have it, you can put your hands up, you better be humble because if you can have it, you don't want to be walking these streets and acting like you're the tough guy, you're the hard guy just because you can put your fists up because as you know, on these streets, if they know you can put your fist up, they ain't coming to you with no fists. They're coming to you with gangs, they're coming to you with knives, they're coming to you with guns. So we, what we do, we, we, we coach these kids, we mentor them and we let them know that, look, you know, you've got responsibility to show the kids, other kids that you can do better, what do like I'm doing, what I'm doing and do better. And we show them that you've got to be humble and carry yourself the right way because, you know, um, the fact that you can look after yourself makes you a, a more serious target, actually, you know what I mean? Because if they're going to come for you, they're going to come hard, you know? So you don't really, the best, the best thing you can do is be humble. And the fact that you can fight makes you don't really want to fight neither because you know what you're capable of. So, and most of us in boxing, we're not bullies, so we don't want to beat somebody up that can't have it without that. Like, they're the, they're, to be honest with you, if you're a trained martial arts, the average guy, he can't have it with you. You know what I mean? Everybody, anybody can have a lucky punch, like don't get it twisted. But honestly and truthfully, a trained martial art is to somebody that's just on the streets. They, it's no contest, you know what I mean? So they don't want to be bullying people. And I feel that um, I feel that martial arts should be taught in schools because I think it's the best fight against knife and violent crimes. 
and, I, and the shame of it is I feel like the government, they must know this. So why are they teaching these things in schools and stuff? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Okay, well let's get on to the fact of the hardcore youths. The ones that are in these blocks and in these estates that are really about gold. And they don't give a damn about Kitson. They don't give a damn about McGill's. They don't give a damn about Flaxman, Julian, anybody out here trying to shine positiveness. They want to get that money. So I'm going to ask you, what's the biggest message you can give to someone like that? You know, just... Um the fast money don't go nowhere, you know. As I said, I'm not, I'm not going to glamorise it, but I've been there, I've done it. Um, I've seen the vicious cycle, the vicious circle, you know. And, and you know, you, you, you might get a little bit of money and be, be on top for a minute, you know. But um, you, it doesn't last because you haven't worked for it. And the, the best thing I can say is, you know, listen, listen to the wrong, listen to your elders, listen to your parents, listen to the people that's been there, to the people that's done it. You know, and um, you know, set yourself. I mean, one thing that I found find upsetting with a lot of the kids is a lot of the kids, and I've been there. A lot of the kids, they lose their way somewhere along the line, where they kind of don't have no ambition. And you ask them, "What do you want to do?" And they're they're looking at you blank, like, "I don't know. I don't know what I want to do." Well, what I'm gonna say to you to do is like, is 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 pick something and stick to it and finish what you started. And even if you get two days into it or a week into it, like a court college course, it could be a trade, it could be whatever you decide. Even if you get two days into it and you decide, why this ain't for me or not. Finish it anyway. Anything you start that's positive, finish it. Because you're always gonna have that behind you. And then after that's gone, you might be able to go forward and um, you might be able to go forward and do what you you've now want to do, what, what you now have a passion for. But what you might find is the thing that you have a passion for is good, it's fulfilling your, your passion, it's fulfilling, it's making you happy, but it might not be feeding your kids or feed, or feed, putting clothes on your back and food in your belly. Maybe the thing that you studied, the first thing is what's putting clothes on your back and food in your belly. So don't keep your eggs in one basket, you know. Just pick something, start it and finish it. Then move on. You know what I mean? Once you finish it, you can move on. But do something, it's very important, you know, like, if you don't have an ambition, um, then you, you can't think of what, you know, pick up a prospectus, have a look, whatever you like, as I say, start that and finish it. After that, you can move on to something else if you don't, if you don't finish it. Uh, so hear what I'm saying, let's talk about the soldier in you. Like, the word is, you ain't got a proper base. So you just train people anywhere. You're so dedicated to showing these youth something different. You'll start training them on the street, on the road, in a block, wherever there's a spot. What do you say to this? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, in the beginning that was the situation. In the beginning I was training fighters without, without a li license, without qualification, without insurance. I was just doing it from passion. Um, I was training in here, right here, in my front yard. I used to train. I used to train in my block, um, like this is my parents, my mum's front yard, but I used to train in my block in the estate. I train anywhere, on the park, I train anywhere. And um, and that's another thing as well, if you've got a dream and, and, and whatever, just go for it, you know what I mean? Put, just start doing it, because everything else will fall into place. I never had a license in, in the beginning, but uh, or I never had the qualifications in the beginning, but because I was doing it, I ended up, Round the people that could make that made me get the qualifications what I needed. So you know, don't let no one hold you back. Don't let nobody tell you you can't you can't do it or anything like that. You know what I mean? Just go ahead, do your thing, um, and for every and from your being positive, everything else will fall into place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So we know you've been shining the youth different. I've seen it myself. Youths are going under you, and they're looking better. They're looking forward. But I'm going to ask you, what's your next step? Because obviously you're doing what you're doing now, but there's others that have started on the road. Let people like Brixton Street Gym, mm -hmm. Terrell Lewis and Brother Ben, they started training people in parks on the road. Now they've got a base, they've got a business, they've got people under them. What's your next step? Well, that's, that's the next step for me because, you know, I'm... Uh, 
that's that's the process you know what you're going to find is that you start in the gym you start underneath people you do the dirty work and the other people get the get the accolades and they take the fighters away and stuff so eventually you have to have your own place and i've always been about me anyway so eventually that's that's the goal that's the aim to um get my own spot and be my own boss so to speak i mean at the moment you can find me various places um, you can find me at Miguel's sometimes, you can find me at, at Feely, you can find me at Brixton Recreation Centre and you can find me at Stockwell Community Centre um, at different times. So, you know, if you, if you want to reach out to me, just get on the social media, get in touch and um, I'll let you know where I am and where I'm not. But eventually, um, eventually I want to be, eventually the gate, the, the goal for me is to have my own gym yeah. and be my own man so that I don't have to um, rely on other people because so far I've, had, I've been having to rely on a lot of people which ain't always, you know, the sweetest. Yeah. It, it people will let sweet. you down. Yeah. yeah, it happens, you know what I mean, it happens. Definitely. Okay, so right now, you're a black man. You've seen things in your life. In the world right now, there's a couple of madnesses going on for everybody. We want to ask you, what does Black Lives Matter mean to you? Um, Black Lives Matter, I'm mixed race, yeah? So um, my mum's English, my dad's Jamaican. So I've seen racism on both, both sides, sides of the fence. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, um, mostly I must admit, mostly on the, on the white side, I'll say on the white side, you get me? Um, but I have seen it occasionally on the black side as well. So for, for me, it's like, um, how can I explain it? Yeah, black lives matter to me. Um, and what hurts me more was when my mum was young and she was being called a nigger lover and be, being, um, I was spat on in a, in a pram, you know what I mean? With my mum, mum put, got me in a pram on the bus, a racist man spat on me, called my mum a nigger lover, stuff like that. So um, also with police brutality, I've had the police call my mum a nigger lover. Um, I've had police attack my private parts and tell me that they're going to take away my child benefit. Stuff like that, things like that, you know what yeah. I mean? And I'm, I'm, it's, it's weird because I know other people that they've done the same thing to, you know what I mean? So racism, I, I did suffer of racism growing up, a lot of racism, and I hate it, I detest it, and black lives most definitely do matter. And it's like, what, what, is, what was bugging me when this thing was going on about the Black Lives Matter thing was people saying, oh, um, people saying like all lives matter of course all lives matter we know that all lives do matter that's standard but it's black people that are getting the brunt of this thing you know what i mean so that's that's the people that we, we they was looking out for i mean i'm glad that this because it blew up a lot a big bit a little while ago didn't it you know what i mean and it brought up a lot of emotions childhood emotions and things you know what i mean and stirred me up the wrong way and i was, I was getting negative and getting involved in it now I'm just like, you know, it's, it's funny, I've got a mate of mine and he always says to me, you know what, if it ain't affecting you directly and it ain't affecting your family, yeah, don't let this move on, innit? And that's my, that's my situation now, you know, yeah. like, I know it goes on, we know it takes place, but if it affects me, I'll deal with it. But if it's not affecting me, then I don't want to, I don't want to know, you know what I mean? Yeah. You get me, you know? Okay, so yeah. if that wasn't bad enough, we've got COVID-19. You tell me, is COVID-19 real in your eyes? What exactly do you feel regards the whole thing? Well, I'm no doctor, you know what I mean? But I don't believe it in the slightest. I, I don't think it, I mean, I've been around, um, at the beginning, in the beginning of it, I was scared, I was in my house, I was sanitizing and masking, I weren't touching nothing. But after a little while, you get to see, I mean, I, I, what I found funny was all these images of Italy and Spain and how bad they had it. Then I get to hear that we had it worse, and I ain't seen no images like that here. So to to me, I just like open your eyes, man. You know what I mean? Like to, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. I I don't believe it. Maybe there's something there, but there's colds and flus, and people been dying unexpectedly from day dot. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if, especially if you're vulnerable, you got other issues, a cold, anything will kill you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You see, I've seen young people my age, younger, older, popping off, dying. So, me personally, um, 
I'm not feeling it. And on one of the one, when it first was fresh, I went to the late night shop and I see an old fella, real old fella, and he was standing at the, the kiosk and um, backed up to give him a little bit of space, you know what I mean, because of this, this social distancing. And the old fella looked at me and he said, he said, young boy, you know what I'm saying? If they go find you, hit I go find you. Yeah? And uh, I just see it like that, you know what I mean? If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, yeah. man. I don't, like, what am I gonna spend my life worrying and scared and frightened about that? Like, don't get it twisted, I do my best when I'm in the gym, uh, the sanitizing, the equipment, and this and that. Yeah. And, I, and I try my best, I do my best, but I'm not letting it frighten. It ain't frightening me, no way. Uh, <laughs> so you tell us, big man, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from this life? Um, the biggest lesson I've learned from this life is never quit, man. I've quit on a lot of things before. I've quit, quit on a lot of things in my life as growing up. And um, right now, I ain't quitting on nothing. But as I say, once I start something, I'm finishing. Um, you know, don't be a quitter. Stick to it. You know what I mean? And that's that's the thing I like about boxing. It's the transferable, the transferable skills. You know what I mean? You, you learn so much from from boxing, preparation and training. Things that you can transfer to everyday life. You can transfer it to the college course. You can transfer it to the work life. Um, and the most important thing that I've learned is like, if you want something, go for it and don't quit. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't quit. You're never going to get it if you quit. You know what I mean? It might take up, everybody's timing is different, isn't it? You might, you might get it tomorrow, you might not get it till, you know what I mean? But as long as you stay on that path, you're going to get it, yeah? And the, uh, one thing I can say for sure is if you quit, you definitely ain't going to get it. You know what I'm saying? Uh. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, as a man who's 100% shining the youth better, what do you think the future is for the youth, the way the world's going? Well, you know, it is scary. It is scary. I mean, one thing that goes through my mind a lot of the time is like, you know, my childhood was colourful. It wasn't the greatest, but I wouldn't change it for the world. And, um, and most of my generation and the older generation people I talk to, they they talk about their childhood fondly, whether it was the, their childhood was the 80s, the 70s, the 60s or, or whatever, they talk about it very fondly. And one thing that worries me is I, I, I'm like, are these children going to think, are they going to love their, their childhood the way that we loved our childhood? Um, I hope they do. I mean, with the technology and stuff like that, everything being done at home, you know, I, I worry that maybe they're not. I worry that playing football on the computer and playing football in the football pen isn't the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I worry that um, they're not going to have the fond memories that we do. But, you know, hopefully that's just me being an elder and being, being a miserable older. And like, oh, because I think all the olders do that as well. Oh, your generation, your generation. So I don't want to be one of them. I'm hoping that they are having a good time. You know what I mean? And they are, they are living a good time. And then another thing I will say as well is that um, a lot of time these youngsters, they get a lot of bad press. You only hear the bad. You don't really hear them when they're doing the good things yeah. and the good things that they're doing. And there's a lot of them out there that are doing well, are doing good. And um, sometimes I don't even think that the, uh, that the, uh, it's as bad as people make out neither, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. I mean, my dad's generation, for instance, my dad was a lot older than my mum, so my dad was like, if he was alive, he would have been like, I don't know, maybe 90, something like, maybe like 80, 90. But even his generation and his friends, they all had the Mars bars, they had the stabs, yeah. they, had, they talked the stories of the stabbing and the this and that. All right, there weren't so much guns, for sure, but, and technology, but these things have been going on from the beginning of the yeah. time, but now it's just highlighted in the media. You, you know what I mean? You get to hear about it, where before you might not hear have heard about it. So, yeah, it's bad, and um, yes, uh, we should always be fighting against it and stuff like that, but I just don't think it's as bad as they make out. You know yeah. what I mean? And definitely not in the world that I'm in. In the world that I'm in, in the boxing gyms, and in the sports, you're seeing a lot of positive um, things coming from the kids yeah. and um, I think sometimes we've got to stop holding on to the negative and start thinking about the positive as well you know what I mean and like you know I'm happy to say that I, in the world that I'm in I see a lot of positives yeah. um, you know what I mean I do hear the negative and I know it goes down but you know there is positives as well you know? yeah. 
Okay, so last and not least, big man, we want to ask you, is there anything that we haven't covered in this interview that you want out there to the people? Um, no, I think we've covered it. I think, well, regardless, you cover it all, you know? <laughs> we've covered it all, um, you know? Uh, there's, you know what I mean? We've covered it all. I mean, the one thing that um, I would really want to off my chest um, is like, you know, was like the, the brutality, the police brutality that I suffered in the 80s and stuff like that, you know? I mean, I was no angel. Um, I was definitely no angel and I definitely done my fair share of, of crud. But, you know, um, there was a few things that didn't sit well with me. Uh, the sorts of, that was on my record that went, but held, wasn't, wasn't a good look when I was trying to turn my life around. Um, things like, uh, assault on police officer when I got battered and I was only defending um, members of my family and um, and I was only a young child getting battered as far as I'm concerned sexually abused broken in I mean this is uh, this is so what do you you got to look after parents you know look out for your kids don't let them run on the street you get me because you don't want your 12 year old getting getting taken off the road you don't want your 12 year old getting taken off the road, getting stitched up, um, getting put in a station, taking these clothes. Listen, when, when you're a young boy and they take your clothes off you and look at your naked body against your will, it does something to you. Yeah. yeah. And these police, this is what they do. They know what they, they, like, they know what they're doing. You know. And I mean, uh, there's cameras now, and things are hopefully better. You know what I mean? Than it was in the 80s and in yeah. whatever. You know. But you know, you don't want your kid being exposed to things like that and broken in. Keep him in the house. If you can't keep him in the house, make sure the activities are proper activities. They're not hanging on the street corner, you know what I mean? Because once you've been exposed to that them type of thing, it takes years to climb out of it. You, yeah. That anger, that bitterness that's if in you. If you ever do. If yeah. you ever do, you know what I mean? And that bitterness, that anger that, 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 that they put in you, it stays with you, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, you know, like, it stayed with me, you know what I mean? It made me kind of uh, in a situation of me against them. And you know, it's only through maturity that um, I've, I've come out of it, you know what I mean? And I've still got scars. Like, if, when I talk about it, I have to relive it. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's abuse, it's when you, you're reliving it, you know what I mean? And um, it, it was on, on, a, on a few occasions, you know what I mean? That, and I'm not saying that I was an angel, you know what I mean? But there was a three or four that there was two, three particular occasions that went on my record that I don't sit well with me, you know what yeah. I mean? And that was two assaults on police officer and, a, and, and an offensive weapon that I didn't have. They took me down the station, and stuck it in my pocket, and, and and done me for it, you know what I mean? And those those and these things happened a lot in the 80s, you know what I mean? And I still I don't I don't know if it's the same today, but I feel as though that there's an agenda to give kids a record, you know, and mash up their life, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and once you get that record, I mean, I spent years trying to spend my record so that I could work with kids, so I could work in the community. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you get you, you get to like closer, right, nearly there, and you slip up, something happens, and it's back to square one. And this is what we, we don't need the kids having. And one last thing I'll go into with the youths them up, yeah, is one thing I will say as well is stay away from the drugs, man. You see that? You see one thing you're gonna notice when you're growing up is not many of us make it out, yeah. Not many of us make it out. But one thing you're gonna notice about the people that do make it out, they're clean living, yeah. They're they're, they're clean. They're clean living, and they're, they're not smoking. They're, they're not um, taking the drugs. You get me? And that's the difference between them, them and us. Whether they're in sports, whether they're hard workers or whatever, but you will notice, you, 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 we'll grow up and whether it takes you long to grow up, but it might take you till you're mature before you look back and see it. But I'm telling you, there, there's one and two of us that make it out, yeah? And the difference, you, you, most of the time, the difference what you'll see is the ones that do make it out, they were clean living. They stayed, they wasn't the ones get, that got, they weren't smoking, they weren't puffing and wasting all their money on, on puff and stuff like that. And um, what I'll say to you is, well, if you are puffing or whatever, don't, because for years I wanted to go back to boxing and I didn't go back to boxing because I, 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 was, uh, I was smoking the cannabis. And the reason why I didn't go back to boxing because I thought I couldn't. I thought, oh, I smoked weed and da, da, da. If you're in that situation, yeah, go back to what, go to boxing, go to the gym, keep yourself fit, you know what I mean? Because if, if you realise that you have a talent, 
you'll kick the habit, you know what I mean, yeah? That's what I did, yeah? I realised that I had a talent and I've got something that I can believe in, there's something that I can do, and I realised that I needed to kick this habit um, in order to go forward, you know what I'm saying to you? So don't let that habit hold you back, you know? Go and do something, yeah? You can do something anyway because that will encourage you to get off of it, yeah? Uh, you heard what the man said, the story's deep, there's a lot more to be told. Big up to Coach Kipson, you get me? Footstep free of the untold stories. Listen to what he's saying, and if you've got youths, make them link up with him and do something better with their life. Learn to train, learn to get their mind right. Big up to all the people that are walking with me. Back soon. One.